Okay, so I'm Christopher Edwards. I'm a graduate student at Arizona State University, finishing up there sort of in the next couple months, and then I'll be going to Health Tech. So this might be the last time you see me give a talk on something like this. Uh, basically, I got roped into being something like a software manager type person for DaVinci, and so that's really enabled me to use that tool to actually further my dissertation, right? So that's sort of where my goal is coming from, and I want to talk to you today about sort of, it was originally going to be DaVinci and JMARs and Tess and Themis, but there's other talks that you're going to see coming up, actually the following three talks, or two talks, and then one later this afternoon by Dean Rogers, that are really going to harp on some of these details. So I'm going to kind of give you a general overview of these tools, well, at least DaVinci, and uh, we can go from there. So, DaVinci is not just my creation. It's been around for a long time, and it's had a lot of people's contributions over the years, um, and so we'll go through that next. So, what is DaVinci? DaVinci was developed to calibrate your process and NASA spacecraft data, um, and basically multi- and hyperspectral data was really the focus of this tool. It was originally developed in sort of the early 90s at the USGS in Colorado for Roger Clark, and then when Roger's main programmer, Noel, moved away, he moved to ASU, and then it's been housed there ever since. And I went to look up the original uh, date that ASU took it over, but it's something like 1997. So this is being developed around the same time that software packages like IDL and things like that had come about. So DaVinci is really a C-style programming, feels a lot like C when you're using it. It's a scripting interface, it's got a backend in C, you can code in C if you want to, or you can write user-defined scripts. And so it's really good for batch processing, or random manipulation, matrix math, spectral analysis, including principal component analysis, deconvolution, de decorrelation stretches, factor analysis, whatever you want to do, you can basically do it in DaVinci. So what else can DaVinci do? Well, it's got a really nice plotting routine. It calls out to the new plot. You can make really sophisticated plots with DaVinci. Um, it reads and writes a bunch of data, so you don't really have to worry about getting data in and out. Um, as you know, new data sets come out, we'll try to support them. Right? So that we'll try to keep it up. Um, what else? Let's see. The other thing that's sort of unique to DaVinci at this point is it really does have direct communication with JMARS, JMOON, JR, all these different J products that the Arizona State University Mars Space Flight Facility develops as well. And so you can actually use JMARS as a georeference data display tool from DaVinci. So you can do your processing inside of DaVinci, you know, basically have a JMARS instance running, manipulate your data, boom, it pops up in JMARS. Oh, I messed that up. Let me change something else. Oh, it shows up in JMARS again. And then you can use that to other data sets and figure out what's really going on for your area. And so we also have an automatic delivery of PBS browse image data from the JMARS backend that DaVinci can tie into. This includes instruments like Themis, Prism, CTX, Highrise, Mock, Viking, and more. I didn't remember all of them. And then something else that's going to be new coming in sort of probably the next year time frame is really the, the delivery of test um, data, which has sort of been notoriously hard to get at in raw form. Right? So most people use test data, they use in or gridded products and not the actual individual spectra aside, outside of the uh, test and PS teams. So Dimitri is currently on version 2.09. It runs on Mac, Windows, and Linux. Uh, we support a lot of uh, different Linux distributions. We have a full documentation suite. I'll show you some uh, screen captures of that next. And it's also open source. And so if you want to contribute, you're more than welcome to contribute. Right? And so that's been something that we've been pushing for lately. We actually have our first real outside contributor outside the more building. It's going to contribute about 100 functions. So that's exciting. So this is what our website looks like. Uh, basically, just general overview. Each function that's inside of DaVinci has this sort of layout of a function page. And it tells you sort of the general inputs, outputs, things like that. Just sort of standard documentation. We also keep track of what's changed for you, so you can see I made some changes. It said, oh, oops, we wanted to actually add PDF output, so okay, it outputs PDF now. And then you have, uh, you can actually look at what those changes were, right? And so nothing super sophisticated, but you can link back and forth to our full subversion repository for the version control. So if somebody has to something up, you can go backwards and figure out what happened. 
So future capabilities. We're looking at nightly builds for easy updating, right, so that you can grab the newest, latest, greatest version. Something that we're really excited about is the incorporation of GDAL. So that we'll be able to use DaVinci as a front end for GDAL manipulation. So both reading and writing, as well as spatial transformations, warping, all those different kinds of things. Incorporation of the GNU science library, right? So that's hundreds of science functions, that's sort of longer term as well. But these are things that we're looking towards. And the incorporation, like I said, of this third party has contributed about 50 new functions. And then, of course, better help is always a plus. So, DaVinci was really developed for the TESS and Themis and mini TESS science teams. And so, what do we use it for? We use it for analysis and calibration, creating mosaics, spectral analysis. Uh, classification, image stretching, all these different things. Test spectral analysis, including on um, mixing, spectral ratios, etc. Many tests, similar. And then it's actually going to be used for the Osiris Rex O test mission that's uh, was just announced a couple, I guess, a year ago or so. And so that'll be the primary tool we use to calibrate the O test data from that. And so this is just an example of the Themis Global Mosaic, just showing you that we can actually use DaVinci to mosaic tens of thousands of images together. And you can keep zooming in and zooming in. You can look at the nighttime data. You can colorize that nighttime data as a layer in DaVinci. Do all these different things. So I'm not going to talk too much about the standard Themis processing. There is well documented literature. DaVinci has been the tool throughout I guess the past decade that has really been what is used to calibrate and process Themis data. And so all these functions basically exist inside of DaVinci and more than welcome to go download it and use it and try it. And so UDDW is undrift and deep wobble that basically is time dependent focal plane temperature variation in Themis that we have to remove. And so the effect is, it's hard to see on this guy, but that is the before, after, and then sort of the difference, right? So this just gives you an idea of the types of processing that the machine does. And we have this R tilt, which is the temperature variation across the calibration flag that has to be removed. And that looks something like this again, right? Getting a little more sophisticated, you have D flag and D streak, so these are detector readout voltage errors that occur on the spacecraft. We also want to remove those. This is more dramatic, so this is before, this is after, and this is the difference again. And these are really, um, basically, this is a spectral filter as well as a spatial filter. So it's a relatively complicated filtering algorithm. If you want to know the details, you can look at uh, Fanfield 2004, my paper that was published last year. And then we're going to get a little more down into the guts, which is automatic radiance correction, which is really this part of the radiance measured by the spacecraft, right? So you have black body emissivity and then the atmospheric attenuation. And RADCOR really removes the radiance emitted and scattered by the atmosphere. So this is actually another very sophisticated algorithm, right? So to figure out what these terms are, well, it's really to figure out what these terms are is actually pretty challenging. Um, but we have developed the software, and I'm not going to show you any code because it's under the blind wall, right? And then this is sort of the key that I think Deanne is probably going to talk about later today, which is the atmospheric surface, atmosphere and surface separation. This is sort of REM ATM inside of energy. And basically what this does is once you have this rad core radiance, you then are looking to get rid of this absorbed component by the atmosphere, right? And so the idea is that you get this information from tests, and then you calculate a surface emissivity using that atmospheric attenuation from Venus. And so this is really the gist of the atmospheric calibration for Venus. You can't do it alone. You have to use test data to do that. And so what we're really trying to develop in sort of the next year, year and a half, maybe longer, depending on how complicated it becomes, is how you can automatically correct a Venus image from testing it, right? And so that involves a lot of different parameters, including time of year, time of day, all these different parameters that you really need to constrain dust opacities, things like that. You want to have points of observation. 
So anyway, that's another challenge that's coming out, but hopefully we'll get something along those lines. That'll be done with DaVinci and then published at that point. So then we have these sort of more non-standard processing routines and remove uh, randomly, I guess that should be uncorrelated noise, right? And basically you have this white noise in EMIS data and you can run a special bunch of filters that remove white noise, right? So these are all algorithms again that have been developed in DaVinci. And so if you use JMARS and DaVinci plus EMIS and tests, you basically use JMARS to find points in EMIS and test data. And then you use DaVinci to process this data through standard processing and atmospheric correction and then spectral unit mapping, which is probably what we're going to talk about today. Uh, and then basically you can use DaVinci to return that data back to JMARS and start to do your sort of geographical information system type analysis. And so really quickly, this is just DaVinci is running in the terminal over here. This is JMARS, right? And so we're loading something that's called DaVinci stamps. And basically what this is, is this is the interaction between DaVinci and JMARS. And so when you start this, you, uh, in the terminal window, basically all I've done is loaded an example image, type in this JMARS command. This image has appropriate uh, projection information, right? And at that point, this uploads that to your local JMARS session. You can actually save these for later viewing if you want. Um, and at that point, you know, it shows up on your map, right? And you can zoom in, and then in this case, I've run the, uh, the white noise removal algorithm. And then guess what? That image gets a little cleaner, and I re-upload it. Um, and then let's say I want to choose test data. You can look at test data, and there's all the footprints that cover this area, right? And then I can select this specific region of test data. And then, of course, you can export it. And this is the part that's going to be worked on, right? So how do you actually identify these areas with that test and EMIS overlap? That's challenging. Uh, and then how do you save out that data? And really, this is the part of the pipeline that's going to be streamlined in the coming years. Um, but as of now, we have this set of tools that allows you to atmosphere the correct test data, EMIS data, and then sort of integrate those back together with JMARS. So that's all I have for right now. And if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Questions for this talk? I have one that's more scientific, I guess, than technical. Uh, you said you used uh, test information to uh, atmospheric correct themis. Do you need to have test data acquired at the same time or are you using some kind of model based on the years of uh, test, acqu test acquisition? So I can, over the last year, my advisor and I have been working with our new grad students in the group, and we literally spent a year on this topic at a weekly seminar trying to figure out what the best way to do this stuff is. And basically, I think what we've come up with is that since Tess and Themis were really not overlapping for very long, we want to look for data that are sort of similar local so uh, similar season, right? Similar time of day, as best you can get. But ideally, what really matters is the dust opacity. So we want low dust opacity test data. And there's a lot of caveats that I didn't go through here. But you basically have to worry about elevation. You have to worry about all kinds of other factors like that. But for the most part, elevation, dust opacity, the ice opacity, things like that are sort of important. Other questions for the speaker? Hi, for Kale JPL. Uh, have you thought about integrating Chrism into this? So, yes, we actually do have tools that are based off of uh, the CAT analysis tools. And so you can load in PDF, basically, you can load in any PDS data you want, right? And so Chrism is PDS data, and we actually load that in, do a volcano scan, just very rudimentary, right? I mean, we still recommend if you want to do uh, like full-on uh, prism analysis, you want to go to the prism analysis tool, right? But that being said, DaVinci does have pretty robust tools. You can create spectral indices, you can do spectral map, well, all the same things that you can do with IDL, and it's free. So that's sort of a plus, right? If you're just kind of dabbling with prism, you don't have to have a $1,500 a year investment or whatever. IDL costs at this point. And so, yeah, it does exist. And if you pull the data in automatically, you just enter an ID and you're done. If you want more information, I'll be around until Wednesday morning, I guess. And I don't have um, my email up there, but again, I'll be around. So just find me. 
All right, thanks again for our speaker.